Good afternoon. My name is Ed Sachs and I am president of my collaborative team. Welcome to this special session of Collaborate, our monthly discussion group, and today's topic on digital assets in divorce. After today's webinar, we will email you a link to your certificate of completion for this webinar. On the bottom of your screen, you'll see a chat button. If you wish to ask questions, please do so through the chat. If you are having any issues, please post to the chat and our webmaster will respond or send an email to webmaster at mycollaborativeteam.com. Now I'd like to take just a minute to tell you about My Collaborative Team. My Collaborative Team is a Florida not-for-profit corporation. Our mission is to provide marketing and educational opportunities for our members in building more successful collaborative practices using our digital and virtual marketing outlets. The main goal of my collaborative team is to be the leading publisher and producer of collaborative process content and to be a marketing partner for our members. We provide our members the confidence, assistance, and platforms they need to distinguish themselves as collaborative professionals. We invite you to check out our website at www.mycollaborativeteam.com. We hope you'll join us and support what, we're, what we are doing. And now it's my pleasure to introduce our collaborate host for today, Dustin Sachs. Dustin is an information security and DFIR, which is digital forensics and incident response expert with over 13 years of experience. As a recognized expert in the field of cybersecurity, he's run proactive risk assessments, incident response forensics, and worked in security operations centers to strengthen the security posture for his client and employers, and is a trusted member, partner rather, in the immediate aftermath of cyber events. He's conducted hundreds of investigations involving hacking, data breaches, trade secret theft, employee malfeasance, and a variety of other legal and compliance issues. He submitted written and oral testimony in local, state, and federal courts. He's a frequent thought leader and speaker on a wide variety of cybersecurity matters. Dustin holds numerous professional cybersecurity, digital forensics, and electronic discovery certifications. He holds a bachelor in arts degree and an MBA with a cybersecurity specialization from the University of South Florida in Tampa and a graduate certificate in computer forensics for the University of South Florida. We welcome Dustin. Thank you, and it's great to be here. And you know, this is a really interesting topic that we're gonna be talking about today, the concept of digital assets in divorce. And it's a, it's a topic that um, has really started getting a lot of traction and a lot of attention in the last few years as we start seeing some of the people in my age bracket, uh, being a 38-year-old, starting to get divorced and starting to deal with the concept of divorce um, and having types of assets that we may not commonly think of um, or, or types of um, value that may exist in ways that were not possible uh, 5, 10, 15, even 20 years ago. I will start off by saying uh, I am speaking on my own behalf today. I, any of the opinions that I provide are my own, and I am not a lawyer. Um, so any uh, advice given in here is not, should not be taken as legal advice. So we're going to talk about a couple of things. We're going to talk about the first, the digital landscape, how we got here, what are some of the statistics that are out there. Some of them are pretty, pretty amazing. So we'll talk about the sources of the different types of digital data that may be out there that um, we may not think of on a, on a daily basis. And then uh, we'll talk a little bit about some of the digital hygiene and things that should be considered when you're going through a divorce, collaborative or otherwise, but definitely collaborative, to ensure that data is um, being secured properly, being handled properly. Um, both in transferring it between parties and also disposing of it if needed. Please feel free throughout questions and questions, 
if you have any questions, please feel free to ask them throughout. You can also feel free to send, send them in the chat um, and we'll get to them or save them for the end, whatever uh, you feel comfortable doing. So some really interesting statistics. Gift cards remain the most popular item on wish lists. According to last year's um, National Retail Foundation holiday recap, 59% of the people surveyed asked for digital for gift cards, many of which are now sent digitally. Uh, video streaming sites, and we'll talk a lot uh, a little bit about those, but are expected to account for 82% of all internet traffic by the end of this year. Um, I think with COVID and, and the pandemic, uh, that number could very well be uh, an understatement, and it could be well over 100% of the traffic on the internet, uh, if that's even possible. 42% of the U.S. population has, has live streamed content um, as of 2018. 45% um, of consumers would pay for live exclusive videos of their things that they are uh, passionate about. Millennials, the age group that was born between about 1980 and um, the late 90s, uh, are the largest consumers and creators of live video, including Facebook Live, which is the most commonly listed platform for live video consumption. 60% of the 100 most popular YouTube live streams happened in the last two years. And what's interesting about that is many of these have raised or have, have resulted in tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of dollars in revenue for those who create the live streams. Um, with over 1 billion users, YouTube is the largest video streaming platform in the world. It makes up its platform, its base is almost a third of the entire world's internet population. Netflix um, has more than 151 million paying streaming users uh, and about 7 million free trial users who typically will then become paying users. And Amazon Prime Video will expects by 2022 to have 56 million subscribers in the US alone and 122 million subscribers worldwide. So the number of, the amount of data that is, and, and, and digital data that's being created um, that has value to it is just growing exponentially every day. This is an old um, visual, but it's really kind of visualizes a little bit of how much data we're talking about being created in, in a 60 second uh, time frame. This is in 2019, it hasn't been updated yet, but the amount of, and just looking at, and we'll talk about some of these sites because some of these sites have the potential to raise and, and to, to re, uh, net the individuals to create content quite a bit of money. So, Sources of digital data. We'll talk through a number of them as we go as we go through this uh, presentation. The first one, the most obvious one, is photos. But what's not necessarily obvious about photos is where you might find them. Photos can be found both on on photo sharing sites like Google Photos or um, Amazon has a photo site as well. Uh, they can be stored in Dropbox. They could be on Facebook or on Instagram. Um, and then they could be stored in on YouTube. They could be shared on YouTube. Um, again, some, some of the what's now known as social media influencers will get paid to post vid, uh, videos or pictures of themselves wearing a product, talking about a product, uh, show, showing off a product, um, interacting with a product. Uh, companies will actually pay for the, the people for that kind of work. Um, as we kind of transition through, we're going to talk a little bit more and more and more about more obscure or things that we may not think of on a, on a uh, 
daily basis, but joint online accounts. Um, Netflix, Prime Video, those accounts, you can, those can be jointly owned and can require a one-year subscription paid in advance. Um, in the case of Prime Video, Netflix, you can pay um, upfront for a year as well. So considering those subscriptions that you might have, um, joint Facebook accounts um, or, or joint uh, online accounts, e joint email accounts, joint social media accounts. One of the ones that I, wouldn't, that I haven't uh, put on here, but another one to think of in terms of um, photos as well and joint accounts is uh, digital picture frames that might be storing photos. Um, the example I'll give my wife and I, when we send pictures to our to, to our son's grandparents, we send it to an email address that then goes the joint email address that goes to a digital uh, photo frame in in the in the various houses that allows us to display those pictures. But those pictures are then stored on that device um, for for both sets of grandparents. Um, so prepaid accounts, think of things like Amazon Prime, Netflix, Hulu. Um, this is also all very important because there's a monetary value to all of these accounts that has to be considered. Um, every one of these accounts has some value, maybe a couple hundred dollars, maybe under a hundred dollars, but they have value. Sources of another source of digital data, a lot of backing up of data of important documents, of important photos, of important files can be done to cloud storage sites like Dropbox and Google Drive. Some even more, you know, interesting is our again online purchased media, music, movies, TV. Uh, where you would normally have had DVDs or, or VHS or something to tangible to divide up um, or to sell and benefit from some uh, monetary value from. Now you don't necessarily have that. You could have um, audio books, music, movies, TV shows that are purchased online, that are stored on an online site like um, iTunes or um, Amazon Video or Amazon Music, where you may not be able to easily sell that um, to somebody else or divest yourself of that. Satellite radio subscriptions in cars or at home are also another one because those are typically paid, typically paid in a short a certain amount of subscription time three months six months a year in some cases sources of digital data and i really like this slide because for me this slide was fun to put together because it's a little bit of an easter egg in here um just to to uh go off on a small tangent right now the uh, top uh, left of your screen, that's the Breakers Hotel in West Palm. Um, Southwest Airlines flight, that actually happens to have been uh, Tampa International Airport. And um, we all, or, or many will know, this uh, restaurant facade as being the facade from Seinfeld. But the important thing to think of when you think of these pictures and when you see this slide is online loyalty programs. It's very easy to think of credit card mileage points um, when you're thinking about dividing up assets, but it's very easy to overlook the hotel, the Marriott rewards points, the Southwest rewards points, um, DoorDash or um, Grubhub or any of the delivery apps that give uh, rewards or restaurants that, um, so in, Certainly in Houston and in, in uh, this area of the country, we have Landry's, um, which owns a number of, of properties and has a loyalty rewards program that can net you quite a bit of money. My um, in-laws will routinely use Landry's points in exchange for value for 
um, weekend hotel stays and um, experiences at casinos nearby. Um, and digital gift certificates. It's very, you know, nowadays you don't have to buy an, Am you don't buy a physical Amazon gift card. You go onto Amazon's website or you go on to uh, pick, you know, name your store, pick your store's uh, website and you can buy a digital gift card that then gets emailed to somebody. And these can range in, you know, from anywhere from $25 to tens of thousands of dollars worth of gift cards. Um, we routinely will get those in our house for birthdays or um, have gotten them for milestone uh, uh, events. Um, and those can hold some significant value. So kind of to, to, to loop back a little bit and talk about a little bit of some of the assets we've talked about, some of the things um, that, that may be in there that we haven't talked about, but when you're thinking of digital assets, think photos stored online, think documents on cloud websites, think joint email accounts, joint social media accounts, online subscription services, online purchased media, cryptocurrency, which we haven't talked about, but as of right now, and this is current as of uh, 5 p.m. UTC yesterday, I'm sorry, today, uh, the price of a single Bitcoin is $8,788 per Bitcoin. Now, Bitcoin, it, for those who aren't aware, is digital money. It's money that can be purchased online, that can be used online, can be used in the real world to, in some countries, but it is money that is not controlled by any foreign, any government. Um, it has got a lot of technological um, money, uh, technological um, underpinnings and things that are being done in the background, but it's money that it, it's, it's something of value that can be used to purchase real things. Um, it can be split into smaller pieces like you would split a hundred dollars into, you know, a hundred one dollar bills and a one dollar bill into a hundred pennies can definitely be split. Dustin, um, let me ask you a quick question, if I may. Is there yeah, a way, absolutely. Is there a way to search for or find cryptocurrency, or do we have to rely on the clients disclosing that they have this type of an asset? Yeah. So this is this is one of those tricky ones because it's something that you have to ask for. You have to ask. Do you have a Bitcoin wallet? Because it's not something that is tied to a specific person's name. I can't run a report, a, a credit report, and get a list of all of the accounts that might have Bitcoin in them. The, per, the Part of the purpose and the underpinning behind Bitcoin was that it was supposed to be somewhat anonymous. And I say somewhat anonymous, there are technical things that can be done to help trace some of that. Uh, act the activity that is done with Bitcoin. But Bitcoin itself is meant to be anonymous. So what you end up getting is a bit, what's known as a Bitcoin wallet address, which is a digital website you go to that has a string of letters and numbers that is your unique wallet. Now, what's interesting or what's, what can be challenging about that is I can sign up for a Bitcoin wallet with whatever name I want and no one is going to stop me second guess it, there's nothing. I could sign up for it as Mickey Mouse and no one is going to say a word or care, frankly, that I signed up for it as Mickey Mouse. I could also sign up for it with absolutely no name at all. So it is something you definitely need to ask for. Um, do you have a Bitcoin wallet? And you know, I see in the chat, Jeff, Jeffrey Wasserman, you're right. It does raise a whole new set of questions. Um, for divide, dividing assets in an equitable distribution scenario. Uh, you know, it used to be very, very simple, like you said, and now you've got tons of different assets that are out there um, and that, are, that have gained a lot of popularity, especially in our now post-quarantine era where we're doing a lot more of our daily living online than we probably, had, than I think 
anyone estimated we would be doing as quickly as we're doing it. Um, online, so cryptocurrency definitely is a, is a unique one. Um, again, online loyalty programs and online gift certificates. Some digital hygiene things, some things to consider when you're thinking about the end of or coming to the end of the divorce process or even the beginning of the divorce process, depending on the scenario, but ensure that passwords are changed. Ensure that if there is an account that needs to be secured, the password has been changed so that the person, only the person who can access it um, has access to the account. On the opposite side of that, don't change passwords for accounts that are joint accounts that should be shared until such time as it's appropriate because you could unintentionally lock or intentionally lock someone out of an account. If you're disposing of personal computers or physical assets, make sure that you're ensuring that there's no personal data remaining on the hard drive. Best Buy and others that, and these others that, um, and even the, like the city-based disposal companies or um, charities have had numerous stories of going and getting a hard drive and finding a whole bunch of somebody's personal information available on that drive, on that drive. And, you know, it's very easy to forget what you've done over the course of three, four, five years on a computer that might be personal or might contain personal information. Um, one of the things, and this goes to my, my kind of my digital forensics training and, and, and background and e-discovery background, but create backups of at the beginning of divorce process to prevent data loss. Um, that way there can't be, there's no accusation that, oh, I didn't get the picture that I wanted or that picture, you deleted that picture or any of that stuff that might occur or even just something that inadvertently happens and that data is lost. Um, we attach a lot of, and I'd, I'd love to hear from the, um, the mental health professionals who may be on here, but we attach a lot more um, personal emotion to our digital data than we've, I think, done ever before. And there's a, there can be a lot of, it could, it could be one of those inadvertent breaking points um, or emotional triggers for somebody. And then the, the final thing to remember on the digital hygiene side is remember to change the contact information for any information or uh, for uh, any online accounts. Once you've gotten to the point where they've been divided, if they're going to be divided. Um, so there's a question about how do you create backups for text messages between parties? That's going to depend on the phone. If it's, but most of the phones now, Android or um, iPhone, have the ability to create backups if they're not automatically doing them. I know in the case of an iPhone, when you sign up for iCloud, uh, when you're setting up the phone, it automatically will do a backup for you. You can toggle. There's actually a, a switch to toggle um, to turn on text messages as part of that. Uh, same thing with Android, but it's it's a good practice to have, certainly. Um, and then the other thing, the other option, you know, and, and I am no longer in the consulting world, so this is not a shameless plug anymore, but um, certainly getting an expert, getting somebody who knows how to do this, who can do it for you, um, is, it, it is a way to um, get backups done properly if, there's any question later on. Um, Dustin, are there, are there, there's other um, cash accounts, transfer accounts. Are there other ways of finding them? Also, like I asked about cryptocurrency, things like Venmo. Or again, are these just things we all need to start becoming aware of, asking, maybe having these checklists? Yeah, so Venmo, Venmo and those types of cash transfer accounts are a little easier because they're going to show up, or they should, I'm going to say they should, show up on bank statements as Venmo, as whatever it might be. Um, 
My wife uses Venmo quite a bit and it will show up on our bank statement as something and then it will say Venmo somewhere in there. But certainly looking for those types of things specifically and saying, hey, I see that there was $100,000 in transfers via Venmo, either money received or money sent. Can you provide us more information about Venmo or access to the account or whatever? And then um, pulling the records from those websites. Um, they're really just intermediaries between the banks. And is PayPal the same? Yes, PayPal is the same as well. PayPal um, should show up in there. And what it categorizes it as um, or how it words it may vary bank to bank or PayPal site to PayPal site, but it's usually going to include uh, PayPal or PP or some sort of indication that it is coming from PayPal. Um, banks are getting really good at classifying that stuff in the bank account records um, as specifically online transfer or online purchase uh, through PayPal. Um, you know, and another question that, that was asked, uh, should, should lawyers consider asking for online account information when starting cases? I'm, I'm gonna, gonna kind of not swing at that one, unfortunately, because I just, I don't know that, 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 that the answer doesn't vary based on the jurisdiction you're in um, as to whether or not you should or, or could be asking for, whether or not you could be asking for that information. If the, if the question is, should you ask for that information? My answer would be yes, you should ask for that information because it's going to be helpful. It's going to be information that you're going to need, you're, you may need or you will likely need at some point in order to do a full due diligence of making sure assets or documents or any number of things you might encounter during the divorce process from the bit that I've learned over the years of the divorce process. Um, certainly, there are things that I could see very easily coming into play in uh, online accounts. So Adam Cordover is asking, does Apple Wallet appear on bank statements in a recognizable form? I, I'm, I'm, I'm going to give the answer. I don't know. I have not seen a whole lot of people using Apple Wallet um, in a way that now, that being said, I will, I will modify, okay, Apple Pay. Apple Pay is not going to show up as anything special because Apple Pay you just really is, is a software on your phone that lets you kind of preload your, your cards into there. What I will say, though, is the new Apple Card that, that's now a credit card that is Apple specific that you may not get a physical card for, that you will see in a recognizable format. You'll get those. Um, Apple Pay is, it, as Cynthia says, is linked specific is linked to a specific bank account or credit card. So it's going to show up on the transaction report for that account, but it's not going to say, "Oh, this was done via Apple Pay." It's just going to say this purchase was made. And when it comes to rewards programs, Dustin, yes. is that something that there's any uh, monetary value to, or is it something we tend to just split? Oh. I mean, there could there could be significant monetary value. Um, the hotel points um, for or restaurant points, for example, do have the the companies assign a dollar value of some sort to it because when you go to trade them in, they'll say you can use a hundred thousand points over here, and it's the equivalent of one night stay in a hotel room, which costs X amount of dollars normally. But great, great question. Yes. That's, that, that's interest. That's an, actually a really interesting, uh, a so, significant. I'd like to hear about that. Eric, yeah. let's put Cynthia Swanson's um, microphone up. Cynthia, let's, uh, let's unmute her. Hey, Cynthia, how you doing? Cynthia. Okay. Cynthia mentions that she's had significant litigation over American Express points because there's a major valuation issue. 
I was hoping she could share. Um, and Kathleen Collinsworth's question is, can, can you split 50-50 and not worry about value? Um, <laughs> well, I, that's that's a good that, question. The answer to that is, in most cases, you can. You really have to check into the, um, the rewards program. I know that people like Marriott will split it. Um, American Airlines will split um, into separate accounts. Um, things like that. Uh, Cynthia, did you get your mic on? She texted and said she's having trouble with her mic. Nope. Anyone else have something to share? Lynn, I agree. The problem is that it's expensive to, to um, value this stuff. It's often sometimes easier to split, and sometimes the cost of splitting it is too high. Eric, try unmuting Cynthia Swanson again. Cynthia. Nope. Not getting there. Okay. Go ahead, Dustin. Oh, it, it looks like Robert Merlin is saying that Amex points are only worth about a penny each. Which, so the, uh, the value can vary significantly depending on the types of points, who it is, uh, who the, the vendor is, who the, the company is. I, I know Amex points are, are uh, usually not worth very much, but um, some of these restaurant points, it's dollar for dollar. You spend a dollar, you get a, a, a point or, you know, one of the ones we use a lot with an with an eight year old or almost eight year old is uh, Chick Fil A, and in that some cases that's for every dollar it's eleven points. So it could be, I mean, it could be significant in terms of the amount of money that you can save up. Um, and and and, and uh, Bob's right; they add up, and there's an emotional interest in some of them for divorce uh, for uh, divorcing people. So with that, I want to thank you all for your time. I'll hand it back to uh, Ed. Great. Thank you, Dustin. I just want to remind everybody we've got some um, interesting upcoming sessions next Tuesday at noon Eastern. If you think the collaborative participation agreement is complex and overwhelming, try living in the head of someone with a processing disorder. Our title of our program will be NeuroBabble 101 and the Collaborative Process, Considerations for Informed Consent, Accessibility and Practices. It'll be um, presented by Rebecca Fisher and Dr. Candice Sakatu. We also welcome and, and invite you to join us this Friday at 4.30 for our happy hour. Um, and keep your eye on our newsletter and upcoming events. We want to thank everybody for joining us. I want to thank Dustin for giving us a whole lot to think about as we start moving forward and doing, um, looking at records that we need to ask for. So we appreciate it. We invite you to join us this Friday. Thank you very much. We will be sending out and uh, making available the slide presentation and certainly your certificates of completion will be available and we'll send you an email. Thank you, everybody. Have a wonderful week.